اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم والعن أعداءهم وقتلتهم وظالميهم ومخالفيهم أجمعين آمين اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج والعافية والناصر وجعلنا من خير أعوانه وأنصاره آمين Dear viewers of Imam Hussein TV سلام عليكم My special Greetings to you on these blessed nights of festivity as we're approaching the anniversary of the birthday of Imam Hussein. Salawatullah, salamu alayhi. Peace and divine blessings and benedictions be upon him. And of course, the following days uh, will be also will mark the birthday of uh, Imam al-Sajjad, Abu al-Fazl al-Abbas, and Ali al-Kabir, and Mawlana al-Sahib al-Amr wa-Zaman, salawatullahi alayhim ajma'in. I am honored to be joined here in the studio by the uh, revered cleric, uh, Sheikh Vaini, uh, and we've been having some fascinating discussions uh, on different topics. And it is my sincere hope that tonight, uh, with the special prayer and assistance and blessing of Mulana Sahib al Zaman, Ajalallah Ta'ala Farajo Sharif, may Allah bring forward and hasten in his reappearance. We'll have a fruitful discussion and you will uh, enjoy it. So stay with us as we discuss topics relevant to these nights and it is our hope that this little service will be uh, approved of by the master of our time salam alaikum shaykhana it is a pleasure to have you here again wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh my honor to be here great so um, it's such a great atmosphere here to be in karbala these days just you know walking uh, in the Bin al Haramain, this lane between the two shrines, and watching this people from the studio, uh, it is really a special gift, I guess. Especially, uh, I guess, for you as uh, someone visiting Karbala and such holy nights. Isn't it that? Yeah, it's case? Just, yeah, it's absolutely splendid. Just looking at the shining golden dome of Abi Fadl Abbas and Imam Hussain it's just breathtaking yeah breathtaking. seeing all the zuar walking around it's just absolutely breathtaking you're left speechless at the sight great well uh, alhamdulillah so we uh, are here and we've been uh, discussing uh, some really uh, let's say thought-provoking uh, concepts. If I may uh, start with uh, what we concluded with uh, last night as a platform to build on and discuss the uh, subsequent topics, inshallah. Uh, sometimes we are caught up in everyday life in this dilemma uh, and it is the question of whether religion and fiqh dominates and leads uh, every action or every minute of our life 
or do we selectively apply religion where it fits and suits us? So, which one is it really yeah. in the West, well. or which one should it be, and how can it be realized? Well, I would say first, we should be led by our consciousness. And our consciousness leads us to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance then becomes incumbent upon us to accept. And then the guidance of the Prophet and the Aima becomes incumbent upon us to accept. But we have to be led with our consciousness. You see, we sometimes can shut off our consciousness in a way, or we know consciously something is not right, but we still do it. Um, and we do it intentionally. It's not necessarily about knowing the rules of fiqh or the rules of Islamic akhlaq, let us say, but it's in how we apply them in our life. And again, it comes down to what it means to us. I mean, if it doesn't occupy a very important place, having a spiritual program, for example, if having, if having a spiritual program does not occupy an important place in our life, then naturally the way we conduct ourselves won't manifest those attributes. And if we want to know how we think and how we feel, we have to go back to our upbringing. And we have to ask ourselves, well, how were we raised? How were we brought up? What were the, some of the um, determining factors mm -hmm. in, in shaping how we think? We have to go back. I mean, it's not simple to change. It's not simple to just wake up one day and just simply say, okay, I'm going to do everything that the religion teaches me. No. It's, it's a lot take harder one than that. Step at a time. So take one step at a time, and and you can't ever feel disappointed that you haven't fulfilled everything, providing you're trying your best to fulfill things. And now, for example, we're in the month of Sha'ban. There really isn't a better month than this month, after the month of Ramadan, to bring in that self-reform, to prepare ourselves for the coming of the month of Ramadan we should start engaging in certain religious practices, let's say that we don't normally engage in or that we are forgetful of right now. Mm -hmm. But we have to do it on the foundation of the love of God. Sort of in communing with God and uh, the spirit yeah. that is within us and cleanse it a little bit, purify yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Right, it's, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who will ultimately purify our soul. Um, and, and he will bring us closer to him, right? That's what we're taught in the, in the du'as, right? In the various supplications of the imams, salamu alayhim ajma'een. And it is in these nights that we have to make an effort to do that, to, to, you know, for ziyara, for du'a, for these things, so we can be prepared for the coming of the month of Ramadan, inshallah. And then naturally, I think fiqh, or the rulings, you know, the day-to-day -day rulings of purity and impurity and salah and psalm and things like this, they take on more meaning when we have a, when we're trying to develop a spiritual relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning mm -hmm. we're trying to commune yeah. with Allah, with najwa, with the whispered prayers, for example. Um, we try to sit in contemplation, for example, write down in a diary the things that we have done, right? Muhasabatu nafs, hmm. self-accounting. Self so in the month of Sha'aban, we can take this as an opportunity to prepare for Ramadan by accounting for ourselves every day, keeping a diary of some sort or something like that, a register yeah. of some sort, which is between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about the things that we've done, which we are proud of and the things that we're not proud of and what we can do to work on those things. Yeah, but of course with a clear conscience. <laughs> have to have a clear conscience. If we don't have a clear conscience, that's, that, well, I mean, maybe we're on the borderline of sociopathy then at that point, right? Being yeah. a sociopath, because sociopaths don't feel yeah. the negative things they that they like, do to others. They feel like, you know, sack you know, of like, sins, just... Yeah, you know, you, know, yeah. Like the, you know, like certain political leaders. Yeah. 
like political leaders, some of them, are known to be sociopaths. Because that is, I know I know we're going a little bit off tangent here, but I'm just giving an example of a spiritual illness. That's the point here. It's not about politics, but a spiritual illness that can prevent us from finding that relationship with Allah in this month of Sha'aban, which is very important, and then engaging in all the amal and ibadat. That people that constantly are striving to reach for power often have to trample over other people's rights in order to get there. Or they have to cheat, steal, and lie in order to get that position. Even if they don't do it themselves, the people around them do it and they know that they're doing it. So I, I remember I was sitting having coffee with a friend of mine who was, you know, in politics for a while, or not in politics, but he was in those, that circle. And I remember him telling me something, and he's like, most political leaders, not all, not all, I'm not saying all, especially in the West, are sociopaths. There's a deep darkness in their heart because they got to where they got by cheating, lying, and stealing. Very often. Not always, but very often. So there was an of element that, of that. Speaking of that, you know, dark side within us, which can, you know, take over and lead us down the, let's say, abyss of uh, kof, uh, probably a past uh, disbelief and apostasy. Uh, we spoke of the concept, very important concept, of dhikr, the state of, uh, constant state of dhikr, and being in constant state of dhikr and remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, and this connection and bond with them. Can that help us uh, gradually sort of migrate from that darkness within this deep recess of ourself into, you know, a brighter side? Yes. Short answer, yes. Long answer is it's a process. Mm -hmm. It starts with, again, well, three things we need to think about here. Number one is really being conscious of, what, of, of who we've hurt and what we've done. Really being conscious of that. And that's hard. In a sense of, you know, feeling ourselves accountable. Real regret. Accountable and real for regret. what we've done. Yeah, remorse. Number two, then in now turning to Allah. Mm -hmm. Turn to Allah with all our heart. Like just be straight, be honest with Allah. Be honest with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, look, you know, deep down, I don't do the things that people may think that I do. Or that I may not be the person that people think I am. Because every mu'min has their izzah. They don't show their dirty laundry to the fellow mu'min. That's in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Um, even the Prophet and the Imams would not want to know yeah. the things that the companions were doing. They don't want to know those. That, that's with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't just sit on a chair and just spill our guts out to somebody about, about you know, the things that we've done in our life, you know, um, in very limited and rare circumstances, that would be okay. And just pour your heart out to God and do that through in trying our best to engage with the supplications given to us by the Imams and the Prophet, like the Munajat of Shaban. Go look it up on YouTube. Munajat Sha'abaniya. It is one of the most beautiful prayers I have ever read. It is a communion of love and repentance with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dua abiham sutamali. Dua kumail. Dua makaram al akhlaq. Dua toba. And on and on and on. Just read a few lines if you want. Don't even read the whole thing. Just read a few lines every night. And then read some Qur'an. Mm -hmm. Because the Qur'an of Qur'an always brings tawfiq. Mm -hmm. Some Qur'an. And make sure that we're fulfilling all our wajibat. Mm -hmm. So number one, deep regret. Number two, once we have that 
feeling of deep regret, maybe take a pen and paper and list out the, the wrong things that we've done. You can rip it up after and throw it out in case someone sees yeah. it. I wouldn't type it up and put it in your email. You never know who could download it, right? <laughs> Write it out and then you could tear it up or whatever after. Number two, then commit yourself to some kind of, to, to, to saying that God knows what's in my heart and turn to God for help. Number three, we have a rich treasure of supplications. Exactly. The richest of any Muslim school of thought. Engage with them. Listen to them on YouTube if you'd like. If you're not so good at reading Arabic, find one of your favorite reciters. Take a night out between Maghrib and Aisha. Or after everyone goes to sleep, just sit, put your headphones on and listen and read the subtitles if you want. It doesn't have to be so complicated. You don't have to read the Arabic if you're not strong in reading it or you just like listening to a beautiful reciter. It's all available on YouTube. Exactly. And of course, make sure to fulfill the Wajibat. Wajibat. First. First. That that night we should, we should not be engaged in this and then miss Salat al Fajr. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, we would kind of miss the point, right? Um, and these are, I think, some. Oh, wait, and number five. And this is the cherry on the cake. Shall I say it? Sure. Ziyarat al Hussein. Salam. The ziyarah of Imam Hussein salam, and of all aima is the cherry on the cake. That the cake is incomplete. Without it. It is incomplete. The soul is forever incomplete without the crowning of it. And that's the ziyarah. Exactly. And that brings everything. Such a nice word, crowning. Whole. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh,. It takes a process, and uh, it's not going to happen overnight. No. You have to be honest with yourself and take it upon yourself to, you know, travel in that direction and uh, ask, I mean, turn to God and ask for His assistance. And the concept of tawassul and the uh, invoking the blessings and tawfiq from Ahlul Bayt. But uh, speaking of dhikr, what uh, one of the instruments perhaps most available to us is uh, the treasures of Qar and Adiyah, which uh, can help us, uh, let's say, enter into a state of remembrance of dhikr. And uh, I think. Uh, one of the greatest uh, works, contemporary works, is Mafatih al Janan, which is so rich with uh, yes. supplications and uh, ziyarat yes. and ad'iyya. And uh, there's something mysterious and curious about this book. Uh, I'd like you to sure. take it yeah, well, from here because, yeah, I don't want to go lengthy. Yeah. Yeah, As go a matter on. of fact, um, I, alhamdulillah, just recently completed my doctoral dissertation on the subject of dua and ziyarat. And a part of that is a discussion of Mafatih al-Jinan of Sheikh Abbas al-Qumi, which means the keys to paradise, mm -hmm. right? The keys to the gardens of paradise, the Jinan. Um, where does one even begin? with this book. It is a collection of supplications and ziyarat and athkar, which are things that we, you know, like the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, that a great muhaddith, a great, great, great scholar, a great scholar of hadith by the name of Sheikh Abbas al-Qummi, may Allah be pleased with him, compiled in the city of Najaf. Uh, and he put a lot of effort into it, and he had access to one of the greatest libraries of his day, which was a library of his teacher, Mirza Nuri Tabrasi, and others. Mirza Hussein Nuri Al Tabrasi. And he had access to that library, and he made use of it. And he was also among the most pious people of his day. I'll give you an example of his love for the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim as -salam, that one day he was having trouble reading. He had an eye problem. And he took a little bit of that ink that he used to write hadith 
just a touch of it and just put it on his eye, just a touch of it, maybe on top of the eye, not inside the eye. And he never had an eye problem again. This is the barakat of the hadith of Ahlul Bayt salam, that he was a man of profound zuhud and aestheticism and spirituality. A man perhaps unlike other scholars of his age. Before he published this book of du'as and ziyarat, he refused to publish it until he practiced every, every single, single supplication yeah. and ziyarat and amal in this book. Yeah. This is incredible. I was just going to mention but that you did. I shall say that the practice of Sheikh Abbas al Kumi is not new. This practice goes back to the days of the of Sheikh Tusi and Ibn Tawus. Sheikh Tusi lived during the early part of Ghibad al Kubra, of the greater occultation, at the beginning of the fifth Islamic century. He was a founder of the Hosa of Najaf. And he compiled a book called Misbah al Mutahajit, which is the lantern for the night worshipper. Was Silahul Mutaabid, and the weapon, you know, for the uh, one that is worshipping all the time, the Mutaabid. He was a founder of the House of Najaf, and he compiled a book of Dua and Ziyara as well, which essentially became the Mafatil Jinan of his day for hundreds of years, actually. For hundreds of years. Sheikh Abbas Kumi hasn't even been a century. Hundreds of years. Sheikh Tusi's book was practiced by the scholars. In fact, it still is today because it's one of the main sources of Mafatih al Jinan. And Ibn Tawus narrates to us, um, if I remember correct, in Fatul Abwab, in one of his works on Istikhara, or in Falah al Sa'il, I believe it's in Fatul Abwab. Ibn Tawus mentions that a scholar like Tusi do, does not compile a book like this unless he wears it around his neck first as a qilada as a necklace. What a beautiful way that he adorns himself first with the akhlaq and the mannerisms and the worship instilled within such supplications and ziyarat. This is the status of our great scholars. They're not, they don't just write these kinds of books for like that. You know, they, they take these things very seriously, especially the books of Ibadat. Um, and this was Sheikh Tusi's practice. This was Ibn Tawus's practice. So naturally, Sheikh Abbas al-Kummi is following a line of a thousand years or more, rather, going back to the time of the Imams, but especially from the published books that we have, a thousand years of tradition. Yes. It's remarkable. So he saw himself, the compiler of Mafatih al-Jinan, saw himself as a part of a spiritual chain of inherited treasures, of gems and rubies and diamonds of Islamic spirituality and spiritual psychology and self-rectification that have come from the Imams to us today. And he compiled Mafatih al-Jinan, which is the most practiced book today in the Shia world. If, as I mentioned in my dissertation, if you enter any of these beautiful shrines, Salaamu Alaikum Ya Abu Fadl Abbas, you will find what on the shelves? Mafatir al-Jinan. And what are people reading from? Mafatir al-Jinan. If you enter any Husseiniya or Imam Barga or Masjid where Shias are on a Thursday night or in the days of Sha'ban or Rajab or Muharram or Safar on any day of Amal or worship, what will we find? Mufatir al-Jinan. Could this just be because he had a self-promotion, you know, he wanted to promote himself, he wanted to have a team, a PR team to promote his book? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I mean, for the purpose of tabliq and letting the world know something's out there, nothing wrong with that at all. But, but Abbas Kumi... perpetuating driver yeah, is something But else. the perpetuating driver of this was his beautiful and clean intention. Yes. Ikhlas. His ikhlas. Which made his name to be remembered for time immemorial. 
Wow, he was a great man, a very pious scholar, a great man. Um, and adding to that, maybe, is that he dedicated his book to uh, Sayyidina Sa al Alameen, Fatima al Zahra, yeah. salamu alayha. And uh, she is the, you know, the Lady of Barakah. Yeah. And uh, so all these benedictions, uh, she's the Mubaraka, Sayyidatul al Mubaraka. Yeah. And this uh, Barakah, I think, uh, uh, has, you know, the sort of, let's say, sustenance of his work and his book remaining in the shelves of every Muslim house and entering every Muslim house partly or maybe largely is due to his ikhlas and his dedication to the lady of the world well he loved her dearly I mean at the yeah. end I mean he wrote Beitul Hazan, right the house of sorrows where he yes. talks about in detail and talks about writes about from the early sources of Islam he writes about the tragedy of Lady Zahra right and what was done to her so I mean he was just a magnanimous personality Animals. of Islam a fountain of Islamic spirituality and love for Ahlul Bayt and a follower of them um, and he is a product of the house of Najaf yes and um, yeah, I mean, that's that's his story, and his book is ubiquitous. I mean, it's it's, it's everywhere. You, yes. can't, you can't not find a copy of, Maf of Mafatih. Um, and we have to realize that what he has included in this book, right? It's divided up into different parts, right? It begins with some of the general du'as and ziyarat, then it goes to those days of the month, or month, those days of the month that are particular. Mm -hmm. Because Islam has a spiritual calendar, right? Some begin it with Muharram, some begin it with Ramadan. Yes, the first month is Muharram. But in some books, it begins with Ramadan because that's the most spiritual month, and then it goes from there. It's not meant to be in a particular chronological order. Oh, no, yeah. So Sheikh Abbas al-Kummi arranges his book with some general supplications and he follows it by the, by the amal that he could find, that he would know about. It doesn't mean that every single thing in his book is authentic. Nobody's saying that. They're just saying he was a learned scholar. He had access to a lot of early sources and manuscripts. He was learned in hadith. And he had studied with some of the great scholars of hadith. Yes. And he was a specialist in the subject of du'a and ziyarah. Yes. As was Nuri Tabrasi, his teacher. Yes. So he compiled this book, The Spiritual Calendar for the Shias, which again, I must emphasize to Mu'mineen, already existed from the time of the Imams. It wasn't anything new that he brought forward in Mufati al Janan, but he arranged it in a new way. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is a very important point about his life and about his work. And then, inshallah, we can come back to that. Sure. Thank you uh, very much for uh, perhaps illustrating in detail what this book is all about, the different chapters. And uh, we can perhaps talk more about his personality and his other works so that uh, our dear viewers will know him a little bit more and uh, during these nights maybe remember him and uh, make him partner in uh, what they do and of course uh, he has a great station with Ahl al-Bayt and may his blessings of course be upon all of us so uh, thank you uh, dear viewers for uh, being with us until this moment after a short break we'll join you and uh, we'll continue this wonderful discussion. Thank you.
back. Salam alaikum. Welcome back to your program uh, delivered to you through Imam Hussein TV. Uh, we are having a wonderful discussion with uh, our uh, great guest, uh, Sheikh Vaini, and we've been particularly discussing uh, the concept of uh, supplications and uh, dua, and uh, more specifically, the book Mafatih uh, al-Janan, The Keys to the Gardens of Heaven. So, uh, to know a little bit more about uh, the this prominent figure, towering figure, uh, quite contemporary, uh, he's got a great book, Safina uh, al-Bahar, The Vessel uh, mm. into the Oceans, which is meant to be sort of a supplementary source to guide you through understanding the uh, hadith in Bahar al uh, So a lot of people don't know about his, uh, you know, scholarly, let's say, um, production. Tradition, yeah, I mean, uh, scholarly uh, tradition and his uh, scholarly uh, production and him being a very studious and well-versed uh, person, not just, uh, you know, compiling things and just arranging them. Uh, he was, uh, in fact, uh, a lot of people say, following uh, his uh, mentor, uh, he was very, I could say, very selective about putting what in his book if I'm not mistaken. Mm. So uh, we need yeah, to well, really get to know him a little bit more. Yeah. Well, Safina Tul Bihar is not really, it is kind of a commentary, but not really a commentary. It is an index. Yeah, like so. I said, it's a supplementary. Yeah, it's like a supplementary of. index with some comments here and yes. there. It's very useful because Bihar al Anwar is 110 volumes. Safina to Bihar is four volumes, but they're four large volumes. So really, they could be like eight volumes. Um, and it's an index. But think of this. Bihar al-Anwar is 110 volumes. I'm not sure how many ahadith are, are in there, but I don't know, more than 10,000 probably? At least, I don't know. Thousands and thousands of ahadith. He would have had to study Nearly, I haven't studied Safina to Bihar from beginning to end, so I can't say he's included every single narration or its discussion. I can't say that. But one would assume that he would have had to have studied 110 volumes worth of hadith. That's a lot of studying. But once again, I need to emphasize to the viewers, this is nothing new. Our ulama of the past have been doing this work. You see, what I mean is nothing new. That doesn't mean it's not important or that he's not great for doing it. He's following a spiritual tradition going back to the time of the companions of the imams. One of the things that we have to understand about our ulama, our great scholars, our mujtahideen, the great muhaddithin, they are not your ordinary khatib. And may Allah bless all the khutaba. May Allah give them all tawfiq to continue serving the madhab. But there is a difference between a khatib and the likes of Abbas al-Kummi, Sayyid al-Sistani, Sheikh Nasir al-Makarim, or scholars like this. And there's many, many other ones out there. Sayyid Sadiq Shirazi and on. Many scholars out there. May Allah bless them and give them all uh, tawfiq to continue the service of the madhab of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim as -salam. And they, their Oops. knowledge of the tradition yeah. is so deep of hadith that they have studied all 110 volumes. I mean, most people probably won't even study one or two volumes in their lifetime. These people have studied 110. And not only that, that's just one small work among their many other works. Yeah. Um, and so Sheikh Abbas Kummi is so I mean. prolific, but Sheikh Abbas Kummi, among all those scholars you could imagine now, 
or the likes of the Said Sistani of his day, let us say, was a prodigy. Yes. He was a prodigy. He was extremely learned, hardworking. Not only that, he was very pious. Extremely pious, such that Mirza Nuri, well, Aga Buzurg remarks, actually, not Mirza Nuri, Aga Buzurg in his Tabakatu Shia, under the biography of Abbas al Kumi, remarks that they did not know of somebody more pious than him. SubhanAllah. Let me put this in context here. In the Hawza of Najaf, can you imagine how many great mujtahideen, maraja, fuqaha, you know, great scholars, great sources of reference they were at those days? And for someone like Agha Buzurg Tehrani, one of the greatest scholars of, of, of the history of Islamic books and hadith and things like this, to say that about Abbas al-Qummi is itself something to take note of. So, they're not, he's, he wasn't only profoundly pious, he was profoundly erudite and learned and sharp and hardworking. Someone that devoted himself to his studies entirely. These sorts of individuals are a cut above everyone else. And that's why there's so few of them. There's so few people of that rank, like our marjas. Not that Abbas Kumi was not a marja, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying people like them, those great scholars, you know, who have given so much service to the intellectual tradition of Islam. Um, and he was one of them. Abbas Kumi yeah, was absolutely one of them. I mean, he didn't only write on that, he also wrote in history. So, uh, what you just uh, mentioned in the last few minutes may actually be proof, great proof, for the authenticity of his uh, production, Mafatih al Janan, in particular. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, so because uh, uh, undoubtedly he put uh, a lot of effort, scholarly effort, days after days and nights into this book. And uh, like you mentioned, and it is a well known. Uh, story about him that he practiced every single item in that book which is phenomenal I mean it's mind-blowing I, I can't and practice even with imagine. understanding yeah and then before uh, bringing himself to publishing the book and if I may just I've uh, heard uh, an interesting story about him uh, which might contribute to our discussion in some sense that some people really take it upon themselves to uh, just contribute to uh, the madhab and as we discussed earlier, preserving uh, the tradition uh, and the, the, the yes and the safe keeping, being the guardian of this uh, great tradition and legacy of Ahlul Bayt. Uh, there's a story that uh, he actually uh, started writing a book and compiled the book. Uh, he meant it to be in two volumes. He just happened to lose one, I mean the first volume, and one day as he was just uh, passing by a bookshop or so, he found the book there. So, I mean, so he lost that first volume of his uh, book, but uh, before he could, you know, get a chance to publish it, uh, the, uh, there's no reference as to how it happened or so. But when he saw that published, uh, what would be the reaction of, like, you and I or any average person? He would just like sue that person or like file a legal case against that. But uh, the story goes that he actually followed uh, the person who had published this book, went to his uh, door and said, thank you. 
you know, I really appreciate uh, f uh, your effort into publishing what I was going to publish. And this is the second volume. Please go ahead and publish the second volume. I mean, it, this is really uh, the the level of khlas and, and, and uh, I can say spiritual uh, station that and ranking that is just beyond my understanding or conception at least. Yeah, I mean, this is, mashallah, this is the level of sincerity yeah. in our great scholars who have effaced their, their nafs, that ego within them. I mean, this is what I mean by saying that our great scholars, like our maraja, mujtahideen, the great researchers of Islam, they've done a lot of work on their spirituality as well. They're not only intellectuals par excellence at the highest, at the absolute highest level, but they've in tandem focused and practiced on their souls. And again, this goes back to the time of the Imams, their companions until Abbas al Qumi. This is a spiritually inherited tradition of spiritual purification and the pursuit of intellectual knowledge morning and night, right? And a part of that is if it serves the deen, it serves the deen, whether it's under his name or under another person's name is immaterial at that point. It's not about Abbas Qummi. Exactly. It's, it's not about, about preserving the religion. Preserving. Now, that person publishing a book that is not his, not right. That's nobody's saying you should just steal someone's book. We're not and take condoning their name his off of it. act, yeah, but of praising the sincerity. But praising how Abbas al Qummi, Sheikh yeah. Abbas al Qummi, you know, responded to such a situation. And we have examples of other scholars who have done this. Yes. Oh, yes, there are examples of other scholars uh, who have also done this. I, I believe the late Sayyid uh, Muhammad Hussein al Shirazi. Yes. They actually um, published the, some of his book under other yeah, people's yeah, names. Yeah, yeah, the late, the late, the late uh, Marja who passed away, right? And you know, I remember hearing a story from some of his students who narrated this to me. Uh, so this is not unusual, and he's not the only one. I mean, all of our great scholars have this kind of mentality and approach to Islam and Deen and the Madhab. Um, and may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala give us a tawfiq to learn from them, to study their lives and ultimately for them to guide us to the school, to be in the school of Ahlul Bayt. Ultimately, we were going to the fountain well, which is the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi They represent that tariq and that way to reach them through the ahadith and the kalam of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi through their wisdom. Um, and Mafatihul Jinan is a product of that wisdom. And there's a reason why we trust it. There's a reason why Mu'mineen practiced the, the supplications in that book. Uh, because of who Abbas Qumi was and the sources he relied on. Like Masbal Mustahajid, like Iqbal Al-A'mal, like Muhajid Da'wah. These are early sources. And those sources relied on much earlier sources than them, coming back to the time of the Imams. Um, and the early period of Islam. So there is a general aura of trust. Again, I'm not saying the book is authentic. And you can't say that about, it, about any book except the Qur'an al kareem You can't just say any book is authentic. No. But there is an aura of trust and respect and um, reliability surrounding the book of Abbas al-Qummi. And it has been translated into two volumes by Ali Kuli Kara'i. For those who want to go and order it online, I think you can. It's translated into two volumes, the work of Abbas al-Qummi. Um, and I would highly recommend it. We are in the month of Sha'aban. There is no better time to start to, you know, start the engine of spirituality a little bit every day. It doesn't have to be a whole big long supplication. Mu'mineen, you know, I, I just want to remind all Mu'mineen that they don't feel like you have to achieve so much. It's the sincerity with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that matters the most. Now, yes, the amal that we perform, we should do them the way the imams have taught us. But in daily night supplications, do as much as you can. It's not a competition. Mm -hmm. Do what you can. Read what you feel in your heart. But do something. We all should, and I advise myself first and foremost, we should all do something 
to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during these months, during these months. And as I said, the ziyara of Aimma is the polish. Exactly. Finishing right? We're building the, the car, we're putting it together, we're making sure the parts are good. But we don't want to show it to anybody until it's polished. Exactly. Can't show it to anybody. It's, I mean, they, inside it looks great, but it's the ziyara of Imam Hussein, which is, you know, mustahab for all these amal anyhow, for the Qadar Qadr. And, and we'll talk about that another day. I believe we're, we're going to be on the wiladat of Imam Hussein, but we can discuss that. But, um, yeah, let's all try to engage in some spiritual practices, inshallah, in this month of Shahaban and take advantage of Shahaban, in addition to obviously fasting as well, the days that we can. Inshallah. So uh, it is uh, something that we need to engage in, as you mentioned, on a daily basis. And we should not let uh, all this, uh, let's say, materialistic sort of uh, atmosphere and climate, which may overshadow our everyday life and cast a dark shadow on our practices, the only perhaps uh, path to salvation in this world, which is full of, uh, I can say, uh, darkness in some sense, the only uh, tunnel of light is uh, following the path of Ahlul Bayt. And what better means than uh, the ziyarat and atiyah, and of course the uh, ziyarat of Ahlul Bayt. Uh, especially Mawlana Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Uh, as you beautifully uh, phrased it, it is that, you know, finishing polish uh, that gives uh, great value, perhaps, to everything you've done. And I think uh, by, by saying that it gives great value, maybe it's, it's without his signature, <laughs> on our practices and everything we do without uh, his uh, mercy he is the uh, mercy in one of the ziyar we say uh, rahmatullah uh, he's rahmatullah so without his great mercy perhaps uh, it would be arduous and difficult uh, mm. extremely for uh, at least me uh, but uh, with his blessing, I think it's just like, a, well, as metaphorically, like a, an yeah, elevator. I mean, if I could just kind of summarize that, he's a highway to salvation. Yeah. I, mean, I use the word elevator in yeah, the sense of I mean, transcendence. I mean, and you can just take a highway or a rocket to salvation, then you got Imam al Hussein. Exactly. I mean, that, I mean, he is that mercy for everybody and all the Aima. All the Imams, the Prophet first and foremost, as being Rahmatullahi lil Alameen, as a mercy to the worlds. And what can we say about Imam Hussein? I mean, it's just, we're speechless, right? To describe his ziyara, to describe this beautiful view, to describe the feeling of being in Karbala right now. The feeling of just being present in the haram of Imam Hussein. And for those who are not able to come, to really recite the ziyara from their home. And inshallah, they will receive their response. Sure. Um, and we see in Mafatul Jinan a great emphasis on ziyarat. Right? Because there's a whole section. The second half is devoted to ziyarat of the imams. So clearly, Abbas al-Kumi placed a lot of emphasis on ziyarat as well. Um, and it's a beautiful section, actually, which guides you through the ziyarat of, of each imam, the ziyarat of Arba'in, of... of um, of Laylatul Qadr and exclusive ziyarat. Yeah, yeah. Some are exclusive, some are general. Um, inshallah, we can talk about more about that on the night of uh, Imam Al Hussein's uh, Wilad. Assalamu alaikum. Ali, Ali, Abi Abdullah. Inshallah. So, uh, thank you. It was really uh, a wonderful discussion, and uh, I believe uh, that uh, remembering people and uh, reminding others of the people who dedicated everything and all their life to preserving that scholarly and spiritual tradition and legacy 
uh, is itself a great uh, act in such nights. Uh, we should not really uh, neglect the great contribution of these people. And uh, I believe personally that uh, these people hold such a great station and uh, they have contributed to the, pre I mean, the, this tradition uh, taking this journey all the way from Ahl Bayt to our time, without them, it would have been uh, impossible. But let's not forget, under the guidance and, of course, the uh, blessings of the master of our time, Imam Zaman Ali. Of course, I mean, his presence, the presence of Sahib Zaman is the key to everything. We can have nothing without him. Yeah. No blessings without the Imam of our time. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much, and I hope that we can uh, continue this discussion on the following inshallah. nights, inshallah. And special thanks to you, uh, great viewers of Imam Hussein TV. Thank you for choosing this program, and have a most wonderful night.